Are you serious? Are you stupid about this, gentlemen? Is that okay? Yes, that'll be good. He wasn't African American. He was black. He wasn't from America. He was Haitian. Yes. He was the only black person on board Titanic. And the reason he was traveling on board Titanic is his uncle happened to be president of the Navy at the time. And he traveled as a young man over to France to get an engineering degree. And he graduated from a very prestigious school, and he married a white woman, and he had a couple of children. But this was 1912. He had a hard time finding a job in France because he was a black man. So he was traveling with his family in second class back to Haiti to bring his engineering skills there and help build up that country. Now because he was in second class, and he was a male, and he was gallant, did he get into a lifeboat with his wife and children? No. No. So he perished, his wife and children survived, she never remarried, and I believe his children went on to do very good things in Haiti. So you probably see that name down there sometimes. Could you repeat the name? Yes. It is Joseph Philippe Le Messier Laroche. So remember Laroche. Laroche. Okay. Now this I'll talk about later, but this is, I think, the only known photo of all of the senior officers, including the purser of the Titanic, together. Now one of these gentlemen is Charles Herbert Lightfoot, and I might have mentioned his name. Does anybody remember who he is? He was the second officer on board Titanic. It's the person that I portrayed back in 2002, and his distinction was he was the highest ranking surviving officer. And he is actually the gentleman right here where my finger is. You're going to see it as the picture comes around. But he's the dour-faced gentleman right here. But he wasn't dour in life, because I'm going to share a little bit of this story with him later on. But that's Charles Herbert Lightoller. Now, speaking of Charles Lightoller, he was in charge of boarding the lifeboats on the port side of the ship. Does anybody know when you're facing forward on the ship, which side of the ship that is? Left, right. The port side, if you're facing forward, is the left side. So to make this easy for myself, I am pointing forward. So you're king of the world over there, Matt, okay? You're going like this. So he's on the back. So to make it easy for me, the port is the red light. So red always indicates port. It's the same thing for airplanes as well. And green is the starboard, which is the right. So light toller was over here on the port side of the ship. And this lifeboat, lifeboat number six, was the very first lifeboat that he loaded, although it's not the first one he attempted to launch. And that's a whole other story we don't have time for right now. But the reason I like this photo is because there are some very interesting characters on board this boat. First of all, the person who's in the very front of the boat, you'll see this as it comes around, so look at the very front, that's Mr. Frederick Fleet. And for those of you who know about Titanic, Frederick Fleet was the lookout who first spotted the iceberg. Mm -hmm. So when he spotted the iceberg, he's about 100 feet above the water in the crow's nest. Mm -hmm. It was the middle of the night. And for those of you who don't know this, it wasn't a stormy night, Titanic said. It was actually a very calm, clear night. There was no moon, but there were a lot of brilliant stars around. And as a matter of fact, the, the sea was almost as smooth as glass. It was something that was very unusual that most sailors even hadn't seen in all the years of sailing. So it was a clear night, no moon, but they thought they would be able to at least, there would be enough swell of the waves, even though it was pretty smooth, to see the iceberg because the froth at the bottom of the berg as the wave washes up, it casts kind of a phosphorescent glow to it and you can see it from a long ways off. Well, the, the, the sea must have been calmer than they thought. And here's the other problem with the iceberg. They think what happened with it is it had recently calved, which means it turned over. And when an iceberg is sitting in the water, the part that's below the water is collecting all kinds of minerals and deposits. And when it tips over, which happens periodically, the side that comes up is a very deep, dark blue or purple, almost black color. And it simply absorbs all the light around it. So here you are on a moonless night with this calm water with a black iceberg. Guess how close they were to the iceberg when they spotted it? About two ship lanes away. There were only two ship lanes away. So if you look at the Titanic, here's the Titanic. There's the iceberg right there. That's how close they were. So by the time he rang the bell and he called down to the bridge and he said, Iceberg, straight ahead! You know how much time they had? 37 seconds. 
They had just 37 seconds. So on the bridge at the time was First Officer William McMurdoch. And the first officer, he did what you would do. If you're traveling at night and you see a deer in the road, what are you going to do? You're going to slam on the brakes and you're going to swerve. That's basically what he did. He said, hard to starboard, full of stern, which means turn the wheel to starboard, which would actually would turn the, the ship to the left, because that's how they navigated back then. And full of stern basically means put a stop to the engines. But because he did that, because he wasn't quite sure how Titanic worked with the propulsion, there's actually a middle propeller, and I'm not sure if one of these models has it, but there's a middle, yeah, this one kind of has it. There's a middle propeller on the Titanic. There's two on the side, and then there's one in the middle. The one in the middle is operated by a turbine, and that's a pretty new feature to give it an extra boost of speed, the one in the middle. But that meant it can't go in reverse. So the, the rudder is right there, so because they didn't have that water washing over it, it didn't turn as fast. And so if he had just kept full speed, but still turned hard to starboard, they might have missed it altogether. But they didn't really know how to operate these ships at the time. That was the problem. So that's Mr. Frederick Fleet, who was at the front of the boat here. Now the gentleman who's in the back, standing uh, in the back with this blanket over him, looking rather dour, which you'll see when you get the photo, that's Quartermaster Hitchens. And he was the quartermaster, which means the person at the wheel at the helm, who actually turned the wheel to try to avoid the iceberg. Now, a couple of things. You may not believe this, and I'm not sure I believe it, but supposedly, <laughs> Charles Lightcolor's granddaughter, remember Charles Lightcolor was the highest ranking surviving officer, his granddaughter, who was born after Charles, Charles Lightcolor passed away, wrote a book not too long ago, where she claims her grandmother, Charles's wife, Sylvia, told her the family secret. Quartermaster Hitchens, turn the wheel the wrong way. I don't know if that's true or not, because dead men tell no tales, but that could be what happened. We don't know for sure. Now on top of that, Light Toller also told his wife that J. Bruce Ismay, who was the chairman of the White Star Line, which operated the Titanic, ordered them to keep going, although at a slower speed for a while, so as not to lose time, until it became apparent that wasn't a good idea. And because he kept going for a little bit longer, that caused extra force on the hull, which maybe caused more damage and caused more water to be more quickly. So if those things hadn't happened, and we don't know for sure they did happen, Titanic might have survived many more hours for the rest of the ships to come together. Now on top of that, Quartermaster Hitchens, not a good guy. We were, when they were in the lifeboats, and he was there because you needed at least two crew members to help navigate and roll the boats, he didn't want to go back to rescue anybody in the water. Even though the women, including Mrs. Margaret J.J. Brown, was in this boat, okay. she wanted him to go back. But he said, it's our lives now, not theirs. So he didn't go back. Now later, Mrs. Margaret J.J. Brown, Molly Brown, she wanted to row at least to keep them warm and to head in the direction where they think maybe some help was coming, but he refused. You know, you know what he did? She did, I mean. She picked up an oar. And she said, if you don't let us row, I'm going to knock you overboard. <laughs> and that's what her reputation was. <laughs> now, not only that, when Mrs. Martin <coughs> J.G. Molly Brown got back to New York City, she didn't leave the rescue ship Carpathia until every single third-class passenger had some place to go or somebody to take care of them. And one of the reasons she did this is she had a lot of compassion for other people. She also happened to speak many languages because most of the immigrants didn't speak English. So she was helping all coordinate this. She also started the first Titanic Survivors Fund to raise money for people who lost everything, including people who survived, their families, and so on, especially Southampton, England, which is where the Titanic sailed from. Entire neighborhoods were decimated because their husbands were on board the ship and went down on the ship. So that was Margaret J.J. Brown. Now there is one other very important person on board the ship, and he's hard to tell, but when you see it, you'll notice there's one more gentleman in here. This was the only male passenger that Lightoller left led into a lifeboat that night. And it was because as they were lowering lifeboats, they were looking around, one, for women to get into the lifeboats, but also for able-bodied seamen to get in and navigate and row. And there weren't enough of them around. So one of the seamen, actually, his name was Hemmings, and he was helping Lightoller load the boats. And Hemmings was a very gallant man, so every time he got into a boat and helped load people, he jumped back, um, back onto the deck to help load more people. But Lightoller thought he was in the boat. So as they were lowering this boat, he looks down there and, and somebody called up, there's not enough semen in this boat. 
And so Lightoller's looking around, and there's no other able-bodied seaman. He goes, is there anybody here who can help navigate help row that boat? Is there any other sailor on board? And this first-class passenger kind of comes up from the back, because he was standing back like a good gentleman would do. And he says, I'm a yachtsman, if that will do you any good. And he's yeah. from Canada. And then Lightoller said, if you're man enough to get down those falls, have at it. And to get down the falls means, here's the port side of the ship. The ship's starting to go down. Mm -hmm. It's like this. Mm -hmm. The lifeboats are leaning out. There was 10 feet between the deck mm -hmm. and where the lifeboat was oh, because God. the ropes were swung out like that. So Major Kuchin gumped, you know, he got his courage. He took a running leap. He jumped up onto those lines, shimmied down into that lifeboat, and he helped navigate that boat to safety. Mm -hmm. Hero, right? He was very, yes, he was an elderly gentleman, very distinguished, but very fit gentleman, obviously. So he was a hero. But when he got back to Canada, I guess what? People were mad. They chastised him because he was a first class male who got into one of the first lifeboats. Even though he was ordered into that lifeboat by the officer in charge and helped save those people's lives. So that's the type of information that I like to share because there is so much misinformation about Titanic, and that's one of the truly bright lights on board. Um, that was when it was coming on board the Carpathia, the rescue ship. They actually took some very famous photos of that. All right. Now this lifeboat I'll talk about later, but what can you notice about the main lifeboat that you see in this photo? It's upside down. And that's collapsible lifeboat B, and I'll tell you more about that boat a little bit. Okay. Yes, but some of the lifeboats never got fully launched, and that was one of them. So, after the Titanic, do you think there was some explaining to do? <laughs> yes. So there were hearings. And not only were there hearings in one country, there were hearings in two countries. What were the two countries? England and the United States, because the Titanic was traveling from to the United States, to New York. It was traveling from Southampton by way of France and Ireland over to New York City. Now, one of the things you might not know about Titanic is she wasn't a British ship. She was actually owned by Americans. Not only that, she was owned by Mr. J. Morgan. Anybody heard that name before? James Pierpoint Morgan. James Pierpoint Morgan, that's right. He was the owner of the International Mercantile Marine, and they had, quite a few years before, purchased the White Star Line. So they kept a British crew, and they registered her in Great Britain for the prestige, but she really was an American ship. Well, when they called these hearings in the United States, the Carpathia got back on a Thursday. Remember, the ship sank in the early mornings of a Monday. She got back Thursday. When was the first hearing? Friday. Friday. The very next day in New York City. And who was the richest person on board? Does anybody know? John Jacob Astor. So where were the hearings held in New York City? The Waldorf Astoria. Because it was the only place that was large enough to do this and have the media come in as well. So the senator who was in charge of the Senator Smith from Michigan, he despised J.P. Morgan. And he wanted to do everything he could to hold the White Star Line accountable. But who was the star witness at this? Charles Herbert Lightfoller, the highest ranking surviving officer. And I'll tell you about his story later. But basically, let's just say he put the whitewash brush to the whole thing. And that was actually more important in England, because in England, the hearings were held by the British Board of Trade, who were the ones who set the regulations for things like, oh, lifeboats, shipping channels, training, stuff like that. Okay. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. All right, so speaking of light toller, this is a beautiful ship called the Sundowner. And I just show this to you now, because remember this beautiful ship, because you might need light toller a little bit later. I'm going to talk about this gorgeous ship. That's a little bit. Now, for those of you who are interested about people from Ohio who sailed Titanic, those of you who went to the Great Lakes Science Center in 2002, I don't think it was there yet. I think it was the next year it came in. But there's actually a memorial to the people who are on board Titanic coming to Ohio. And for those of you who didn't know this, most of the people who were traveling to the United States were traveling to the Great Lakes region. Why were they traveling to the Great Lakes? It's where the jobs were. Yeah. Okay. 
So since most of them were traveling here, there are a lot of fascinating stories, but the one story that I like to share, and if you want to learn more about it, there's a book called Titanic, The Great Lakes Connections, and there's other newer books out there too, but this one's got really good stories in it. But I want to tell the story of a Mr. J. Yates. Looks a little bit like a shady character, right? <laughs> kind of like this young man up here. <laughs> now, Mr. J. Yates always carried this with him. These are White Star Line playing cards, because what was Mr. Yates? <laughs> he was a gambler. He was what we called a card sharp, or you might call it a card sharp, but a card sharp was the term at the time. And he was a gambler. And very famously, a letter appeared at a New York newspaper, and it was supposedly handwritten by him, and it was delivered by supposedly another passenger who wrote a letter, and said, Mr. J. Yates was a passenger on board Titanic. I think he was, a, I think he was a, a gambler, I'm not quite sure, he might have been traveling under another name, but I wanted to let his mother know, because he wrote me this letter to give to his mother, about how much he loved her, that he helped, you know, that he actually helped save people by putting the woman in the lifeboat, and he was very gallant. So when his mother got this, she's from Findlay, Ohio, anybody know where Findlay is? Okay. So she was devastated, but she was also really heartened by the fact that her son was on board, but helped save other people's lives. Well, she was really happy, but she shouldn't have been because he was never on board Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> he rigged the whole thing to make people, to make the authorities think he was on Titanic when he was safely back in England because he was wanted for quite a few charges in the United States and he was trying to throw the authorities off his tail. <laughs> so that's the most famous person from Ohio who was never on board <laughs> Mr. J. Yates. <laughs> so this is a picture of the memorial that's at the Great Lakes Science Center, and appropriately it looks out onto Lake Erie. So the next time you folks go to the Great Lakes Science Center, please go around to the back, to the key there, to the pier, and you'll see this memorial to the people from Ohio. Now, somebody asked me about this before. Puppies. <laughs> Were there pets on Titanic? Yes. Yes. There are actually nine dogs on Titanic. There might have been a cat on Titanic. There is definitely a rooster and some hens on Titanic. There is a canary on Titanic, and there might be might have been some other assorted small animals as well. Um, most famously, a canary made the trip from Southampton, England, to Cherbourg, France, which is a very short journey. And I think that canary had to pay the same price as the third class passenger. Okay. Now the other animals on board, the primary ones were dogs, and of course, who had the dogs? First class passengers, including John J. Bastard. He had an Airedale named Kitty. Now, most of the dogs were kept in kennels, but some of the dogs were allowed to stay in their master's quarters if they were the smaller lap dogs. So, if you think about Titanic and the number of people who survived, about a third of the people survived, two thirds perished. So, of the nine dogs, how many do you think survived? Three. So, three out of nine. So, just like the passengers, a third of them survived. And basically, the ones who survived were the small dogs that actually were with their masters in the cabins. Now, there was one woman, very famously, she was a first-class passenger. She was offered to take her dog into the lifeboat, but she didn't feel it was the right thing to do, so she left the dog in her cabin. She felt if there was a space for another person to get in, she was going to give that space to a person. So those are the animals on board. Now, the wireless. We mentioned the wireless before. <coughs> Do you know who invented the wireless telegraph? Mark Coney. Guess who actually operated the wireless on board Titanic? Mark Coney operators. They didn't work for the White Star Line. Their primary job was not safety. Their primary job was to do what? Personal. Make money. And you made money by sending messages for the people who could afford it, which were the first class passengers. So to put it in perspective, it cost about somebody, the average person at the time traveling third class paid one to two months wages to travel on Titanic. One to two months wages, depending on what you did for a living. It cost about the same as that, maybe a little bit less, to send one message. And that was only to send 10 words. If you wanted to send an extra, every extra word was 35 cents. Which at the time was expensive. 
Now, here the, here's the thing. Whenever they got messages about uh, navigation, about icebergs, about other things like that, they were supposed to send it to the bridge. And the two wireless operators, I mean, Jack Phillips, he was the senior operator, and Harold Bride's the younger man here, they did send messages to the bridge. But do you know what the problem was that year, in April of 1912? Lots of ice. There was lots of ice. It was an unusually warm winter, and more ice had come off of Greenland and was floating down into the channels. And after a while, they stopped sending the messages up to the bridge. And up until that time, none of the iceberg was really that severe a danger. But the last message that they got would have told the officers on the bridge there was an ice field straight ahead, but that message never got to the bridge. Because they were so busy. And there's um, basically, they made up for it though. Because when the Titanic went down, they sent out um, rescue messages. Did they send out SOS? They sent out both. CQD was the act, was the call that most wireless operators used up until that time. But SOS had recently been adopted, but not many ships had used it. And I think one or two other ships had used it, but there were, um, I think, freighters or so on. I believe Titanic was the first passenger ship to use it. And so they stayed at their stations the entire time she was sinking. I remember who was down below to make sure they had electricity? The engineers. So they, even after the captain came in and said, you've done all you can now, men. It's every man for himself. You're relieved. They stayed until the power went out. They stayed until they can, couldn't send messages anymore. And so they basically both went down for the ship. And do you know if either of them survived? Does anybody know? One of them survived. And the one who survived was the young one, Mr. Harold Bride. Do you remember that upside-down lifeboat that I showed you before? They both got on board that upside-down lifeboat, but unfortunately, Jack Phillips, the senior operator, he was not in a good way, um, and so he didn't make it through the night, and his body slipped into the ocean before they were rescued. So he froze to death. But Harold Bride, who made it onto board the Carpathia, he had very damaged legs, very similar to Dick Norris, the tennis player I told you about before. So they bandaged up his legs, and he worked with the wireless operator from the Carpathia, sending messages the entire time back to New York City to make sure they can communicate with loved ones and rescue ships and things like that. And he was the very last person to get, out, get off the Carpathia when they got to New York City. He stayed in the port, still sending messages, and you can see from this photo, he had to be helped off because his legs were so badly damaged. Right. Now, victims or villains? You've heard about a lot of victims on board Titanic, a lot of villains on board Titanic. Do any names pop into your head when you think of who was a villain on board Titanic? Ismay. Ismay? Is anybody other than you? <laughs> you know who J. Bruce Ismay was? Was the guy that designed the ship? That was uh, no, Thomas he Andrews. He was, like the he was also a board, but he went down with the ship. The manager of the White he was the managing director of the White Straw Line. So basically, he was the head honcho. He reported to J.P. Morgan. Right? So J. Bruce Ismay was actually on board Titanic, traveling in the quarters that J.P. Morgan was supposed to be traveling in, but he actually didn't get on the ship for various reasons. He said he was sick. Other people said he was staying with his mistress. So, but J. Bruce Ismay actually tried to help load passengers and women into the lifeboats. But you know what? He wasn't a sailor. So guess what? He was in the way. What did Chief Officer Wilde, who was lo loading the boats on the starboard side of the ship, here's the chairman of the board trying to help you, but he keeps getting in the way. What did he finally do? Get out. You, you'll do better over here. Just go stand back. So Ismay did that, and he felt bad because he wanted to help. He wanted to get people in the lifeboats. He wanted to do something, and he was very frustrated. So as the last lifeboat was being loaded on the starboard side, the very last lifeboat, which was one of the um, emergency lifeboats, they're calling around for women and children. Nobody's around. You know where they all were? Up at the stern of the ship. Or in the rear of the ship. So what did he do as the lifeboat was being lowered? There's nobody else there. There's plenty of room in the boat. What did he do? <laughs> he paid for it big time. Because obviously he got back to New York City. He was part of the hearings, and they grilled him mercilessly. Same thing happened in England over and over again. All I want to say is, who are we to judge? If you're there, yes, it's your ship. You thought you had built a safe ship. You're trying to help. 
you're at the end, the ship is going down, you know it's going down, there's room in a lifeboat. You, you gentlemen here, think about it. What would you do? And they didn't portray it that way in the movie either. The movie. No. They made him look more villainous. Yes. Like he just saved truth himself. About everything. Yes. Now, let's see. Now, of course, there were a lot of wealthy people on board. We also mentioned John Jacob Astor. So let's talk about some of those wealthy men. Uh, one of them, we'll start with this because of wealthy men. This is the captain. This is a memorial to Captain E.J. Smith. Did the captain go down with the ship? Yes. yes. Was he considered a villain or a victim or a hero? The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Depending who you talk to, he was a villain, he was a victim, and he was a hero. He was a villain because he didn't train his people properly. He was going too fast. He didn't need iceberg warnings. He was a victim because he was doing exactly what any other ship captain of the time would have done in the same situation. Any other ship captain would have done the exactly the same thing. And he was a hero because he did try to keep some calm and order, although he didn't know really what to do because he had never been in an experience like that before because he didn't have a whole lot of incidences in his life. So it was all three. Now, as far as other wealthy people go, look at these two fine people. Now, this is Sir Cosmo and Lady Lucy Duff Gordon. And they were also traveling on the Titanic under a assumed name, like our friend Mr. Navratil, who had the, the Titanic twins we mentioned earlier. But they were traveling under an assumed name because Lady Duff Gordon here, she was traveling to the United States for April Fashion Week. So on board Titanic were things like ostrich feathers and dragon's blood, which was a special type of um, dye that they used on things. They had all this stuff to use for Fashion Week. And she was traveling because she operated a line of, of ladies' clothing stores that sold, cover your ears, <laughs> lingerie. <laughs> but on top of that, she was in arrears on her taxes and how she filed things in the United States. So the United States government was looking for her. So she was traveling for Fashion Week to look over her businesses under her assumed name. Now the reason that many people consider them villains is they got into a lifeboat that was hardly full at all. I think there was only about 12 people on board that lifeboat. And on top of that, when they were in the lifeboat and the ship went down, they didn't go back to get passengers or people in the water. On top of that, they asked the crew members who were on board, well, how, what are you going to do now? And they said, well, we've all lost our kids. We've got nothing. And he offered to pay them, I think it was five pounds a piece, which was quite a lot of money. It was about the money in the same as the passage. Now, if they offered it, they found in their minds to help these poor crew members who had nothing and had families at home to support. When they got back to New York City and got to the hearings, was it interpreted that way? It was interpreted as a bribe. Right. And we don't really know what happened for sure, but I like to think that they weren't that callous. But obviously, I don't think they ever went to the United States again after that, and they ended up getting divorced. Now this gentleman, and I have to look at his name again because I can never pronounce it, is Mr. Masubumi Hosono. So he's French, right? <laughs> Mr. Masubumi Hosoni was the only person from Japan on board Titanic. Now he was traveling in second class, and he actually happened to be a civil servant for the country of Japan, and he had been in Russia studying the railroad system. Because at the time, Japan didn't have a really good railroad system, because he knew now. Yes, thanks in part to this gentleman, because he was studying how they did it in Russia, and he was going back to Japan by way of the United States and look at the railroads there. Well, during the sinking, he was helping load people into boats, he was throwing stuff overboard, he went down with the ship, he found himself in the water, and he actually found an upside down um, door, I think, that was floating, and he strapped himself to that door to stay afloat, and one of the only lifeboats to go back was by 5th Officer Lowe, and they actually happened to find him floating in the water, and at first they thought he was dead, but the women insisted that they bring him on board. And they managed to um, get him revived, and the officer didn't want to bring him on board, because they were very prejudiced back then. But after the woman warmed him up, got him revived a little bit, they put a cloak over him, he helped row that boat, helped keep things calm, and he was a hero to the people in that lifeboat. Back in Japan, was he a hero? No. Because in Japan, saving face, of course, is very important. And he was a male passenger in second class who survived. So he was fired from his job. 
He was hired back later, but he was a broken man. And as a matter of fact, in textbooks for quite a while, they used the term Hosoni, or I'm sorry, Hosono, as somebody who was a coward. But I think years later we can see things in a new light, and Mr. Masubini Hosono was a true light in World Titanic. Now, there are some other ships on board, and I'm looking at the time here, because I could talk all day, as you can probably figure out. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about these ships later, but there's some important ships on board. One of them is called the Californian, which was supposedly the mystery ship that was seen in the distance, and the other was the Carpathia, which I've already established, if you're paying attention, was what? The Carpathia was the rest of the ship. All right. Now, for true Titanic history, I already mentioned the last surviving male passenger passed away in 2001. Do you remember who he was? Navratil. Mr. Michel Navratil, that's right, one of the Titanic orphans. So he survived a very long industrial life, industrious life, he was an outstanding citizen. Another woman who survived was the highest, uh, longest living woman, and that was Melvina Dean. And if you look on the right, she was just a little itty bitty thing. She was two months old. As a matter of fact, she was the younger survivor of Titanic, and when they brought her to the Carpathia, they had to put down like potato sacks to haul the little kids up to the, to the side of the Carpathia. Now, of course, she doesn't remember anything about it, but she talked to her mother about it over many years, and she never really talked about it much. And so what happened? The James Cameron movie. The ja they found it, and then James Cameron decided to do the movie, then the movie came out, and some reporters in England hunted her down as being one of the last surviving people, and you know what? She blossomed. And she didn't talk so much about the tragedy. She talked about what I'm doing here now. She talked about the people on board, about the gallantry on board, about what she remembered about the time, about the lessons that were learned. And that's why I do this, this program, is to talk about the Titanic Fund. So that's Melvina Dean, who is an awesome woman, and I've seen her interviews quite a few times. So if you go online to YouTube or something else, you can look up Melvina Dean. She's got a lot of interviews out in this part. Now this, I'll just cut this brief because we're running out of time here a bit. See all these gentlemen? They're famous gentlemen like J.P. Morgan, Guglielmo Marconi, Henry Clay Frick. If those of you who are from Pittsburgh know, Henry Clay Frick was a big name there. Mr. Vanderbilt. You've heard of the Vanderbilt name before. Um, oh, and this one you might like, Milton Snavely Hershey, as in Hershey's chocolate. All very distinguished gentlemen. How many of them went down with the ship? Why? But they all had tickets. Every single one of them had tickets to go on board Titanic, but for one reason or another, they never got on board. Like the Cyberlings of Akron. Like the Cyberlings were supposed to be on the next trip. Right, they were going to take it back to England. Yes, they were going to be on the next, the way around. The next trip. But of all the people who said they were yes. going to be on Titanic, but they didn't get on for some reason, it would have been over 100,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that. All right, so with that, obviously it's been 104 years now since Titanic sank. And I'm sure you have many questions. So what I'd like to do now is give you guys a brief chance to think about what I've talked about. We're going to take an intermission. I believe there's some refreshments out there for you. And when we come back, I'll take a few questions. Fifteen minutes.